today I'm going to be talking about this really cool neuroscience technique called optogenetics. Optogenetics is really useful in neuroscience research because it allows you to determine the functions of different brain regions. I want to talk a bit about what has been done with optogenetics and also the potential clinical applications. To understand how optogenetics works, you need to know some of the neuroscience basics. The brain is a network of neurons that communicate with each other in specific ways and cause specific behaviors. The image below shows the basic anatomy of a neuron. Neurons receive signals from other neurons at their dendrites. They have cell bodies which contain their nucleus and a long extension called an axon. At the end of the axon is an axon, is an axon terminal, which releases neurotransmitters onto the dendrites of other cells. When a nerve cell communicates with another nerve cell, it first depolarizes, in other words, gains a more positive charge, and releases its neurotransmitter into the space between neurons. You can see illustrated in the images here. When neurons receive neurotransmitter from another cell, the signal travels down the dendrites and the cell body and down the axon where it causes the release of neurotransmitter. The brain has regional specificity, so particular sets of nerve cells in particular brain areas perform specific jobs. In the image to the right, a few brain regions with different jobs are highlighted. In green is an area called the amygdala, which plays a critical role in fear responses. In purple is the pituitary gland, which releases hormones into your bloodstream. In red is the hypothalamus, which plays a major role in maintaining homeostasis. And in yellow is the pons, which plays a role in controlling sleep. These are just a few of the many brain regions in the brain. Now I'm going to talk about optogenetics. Optogenetics is a way to turn cells on and off using light. In optogenetics, animals are genetically modified to express a protein called generodopsin 2 in specific cells. Cells with generodopsin depolarize, or in other words, turn on, in response to light. In the animation on the right, you can see the generodopsin proteins all over the cell body. When light hits the cell, generodopsin opens and causes the cell to depolarize. So how does it work? First, I want to talk about how our eyes detect light. Light responsive cells in your eyes have light sensitive proteins called opsin. For color vision, humans have three opsins expressed in different cells, each responding to a different wavelength of light corresponding to red, green, and blue in your retina. When light interacts with these opsins, it results in a signal being sent to your brain. Color vision results from a combination of active cells in your retina. Genetic material for a light sensitive protein was also found in algae. Like plants, algae are photosynthetic organisms, which means they need sunlight to grow. Algae have the ability to detect light and use that ability to move to places with the most sunlight. Algae have eye spots that contain an opsin-based channel called channelrhodopsin, which allow it to detect light. Channelrhodopsin protein is located on the membrane above the eye spot. Below that portion of the plasma membrane is a carotenoid layer that can reflect light in such a way that channelrhodopsin only senses light from one side of the algae. The algae uses that signal to move either toward or away from light sources. The DNA for the channelrhodopsin protein was isolated from algae. To understand how you can get channelrhodopsin into neurons, I'll explain a little bit about how viruses work. Viruses are made of DNA or RNA and are encased in a protein coat. Viruses require cell proteins to read its DNA or RNA in order to replicate and spread. In the image to the right, you can see how a virus first attaches onto the cell, injects its genetic material, which codes for the protein coat that contains the virus. The cell's machinery can't tell the difference between its own DNA and the viral DNA, and begins to replicate the virus, and begins making the protein coat that encases the virus. Viruses can be modified so that it's not lethal, and the cells are unable to replicate. DNA of your choosing can then be inserted into the virus. Viruses can be injected into an animal and the cells infected with the virus will express your chosen DNA. An optogenetic experiment can be done following five basic steps. First, you have to design a DNA construct that has a channelrhodopsin protein and a promoter sequence that makes it so channelrhodopsin is only expressed in specific cells. The construct is then inserted into a virus and then the virus is injected into a specific brain area. An optic fiber can be implanted into the animal and light can be delivered through the optic fiber. This allows you to control when the cells are turned on and off by controlling the light. Optogenetics has been used to probe the functions of many different brain areas. An example of this can be seen here. The author sought to probe the function of a brain area called the subfornical organ. 
This area has been previously shown to be activated by dehydration. In this video, the mouse has set a Chanarodopsin virus and directed into the subfornical organ. When the light is off, the mouse shows no interest in, in the water spot to the left. However, when the light is turned on, the mouse immediately begins to drink and stops as soon as the light is turned off. Previous studies have shown using electrical stimulation similar results. However, what optogenetics offers that electrical stimulation doesn't is cell type specific stimulation. The authors of this paper showed that optogenetic stimulation of subfrontal organ neurons that express the transcription factor ETV1 caused a robust increase in drinking even when the mouse is fully sated with water. They also uncovered the existence of neurons whose function is opposite ETV1 neurons. These neurons express the gravity transporter VGAP. They showed that optogenetic stimulation of these neurons prevented drinking even when the mouse was water deprived. Another example of how optogenetics can elucidate the function of different brain areas can be seen here. It was previously shown that stimulation of the subthalamus, including an area called the zona incerta, induces binge-like eating. The authors sought to probe the functions of the zona incerta and its downstream target, paraventricular thalamus. In this video, optogenetic stimulation of zona incerta GABA neuron terminals in the paraventricular thalamus rapidly induces feeding. They also showed that using optogenetics that glutamatergic neurons projecting from the parasubthalamic nucleus to the paraventricular nucleus of the thalamus can act in opposition to the zona incerta and inhibit food intake. Imbalances in activity of these neurons can lead to anorexia or obesity. In this paper, the authors sought to explore the role of the central amygdala in predatory behaviors. To do this, they injected Chenorhodopsin into the central amygdala of this mouse and placed it in a box with a small moving toy to simulate prey. As you can see, when the light is off, the mouse ignores the toy and even moves to avoid it. However, when the light turns on, the mouse immediately begins to aggressively bite the toy, confirming the role of this brain area in predatory behavior. Obgenix also has many potential clinical applications. One application that is currently in clinical trials is the use of optogenetics to treat blindness in people with retinitis pigmentosa. In retinitis pigmentosa, the light-sensitive cells in your eyes, called rods and cones, begin to die off. What you can do is transfect the ganglion cells that relay the signal from the rods and cones to the brain. This gives light sensitivity to those cells and bypasses the need for the dying rods and cones. Optogenetics can also be used for the treatment of diseases that cause muscular weakness. Normally, signals from your brain travel down to motor neurons in your spine whose nerve terminals innervate your muscles. When these cells are activated, it stimulates muscle contraction. Current treatments of muscular atrophy involve electrical stimulation of these neurons, but this could also be achieved with optogenetics. Stimulation of chenorhodopsin expressing motor neurons using skin penetrant LED lights can also achieve the same effect. Another potential application of optogenetics is in epilepsy. During epilepsy, neurons in a particular focal area begin to become overactive and fire in a synchronous pattern that can cause a spread of neural activity throughout the brain, causing seizures. To help prevent seizures, an inhibitory chenorhodopsin virus can be injected into the focal area. A device can then be implanted into that area which can detect the onset of an epileptic attack and flash a light. This would help stop the attack before it even begins. There are many other potential clinical applications of optogenetics, and I'll include links in the description with more info. In conclusion, neuroscience is the study of the brain and nervous system. Neurons in the brain form a network of interconnected cells with groups of cells performing specific functions. With optogenetics, you can turn cells on and off using light. Techniques like optogenetics can be used by neuroscience to understand how the brain works, and it has many potential clinical applications.